This is the J. Scott Outdoors podcast on Western big game hunting and fishing brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster, hunt more, go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and use the J. Scott promo code when signing up to receive a $50 Kuyu gift card. I'm your host, J. Scott, and I live and breathe hunting and fishing, spending half the year in the field experiencing God's creation. I hope you'll enjoy hearing about our adventures. Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we're going to have a really cool episode with Donald Trump Jr. And we're going to get to hear about uh, his passion for the outdoors and hunting and fishing. Uh, Before we get to that, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. Don't forget that Montana uh, elk and deer application deadline is due uh, March 15th. And also March 23rd is the New Mexico um, elk, deer, sheep, uh, ibex, pretty much all the big game species in New Mexico. And you can go on gohunt.com forward slash insider and check out all of their um, application strategies for the different states and goes through the different odds of each unit and each animal and so make sure uh, you go on there and and uh, check out which units are the best and look at their uh, breakdown and and uh, total analysis the application strategy for both of those states also like to remind you that march 15th here in phoenix arizona um, dar colburn my uh, guiding partner dar colburn and i are going to be doing a turkey hunting seminar at the Calvary Community Church for the Desert Christian Archers. That's Tuesday, March 15th, uh, starting at 6 p.m. They're going to be giving away raffle prizes, door prizes. Uh, They're going to have refreshments there. And uh, Dara and I are going to give a video presentation of uh, how to hunt turkeys, and we're going to field a bunch of questions from the audience. So uh, if you're a listener of the J. Scott Outdoors podcast, please make sure to look me up. I'd like to meet every one of you uh, there and uh, just appreciate your support. They are asking us to, it is a free seminar, but please uh, support the Calvary Community Church Mana Ministry uh, Food and Toiletries Drive. Uh, bring any non-perishable food items or toiletries, soap, toothpaste, deodorant, And uh, that will be your admission in the door. So let's help support them. That starts at 6 o'clock. And uh, we're going to have a great time out there. I also like to remind you that I I am now booking uh, Gould's Turkey Hunts in Sonora, Mexico for the 2017 season. Uh, 2016 is pretty well booked up. And uh, I am taking deposits for 2017. And I only take a... A uh, handful of people, so uh, you can email me at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. Also, Dara and I uh, have uh, a few slots left for the 2016 17 uh, coos deer season in Mexico, and uh, we've got several different hunt dates in December and January to choose from. So you can also email me at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com if you need more information. And uh, let's get right into the episode. I want to thank you guys, uh, the listeners here at the J. Scott Outdoors podcast, uh, for all your support. And I appreciate all the emails that I get every single day uh, with all the positive comments and feedback and all the questions. And a bunch of these episodes are due to Uh, The topics on these episodes are due to emails that I get, people requesting uh, our guests here on the podcast. So I want to thank our sponsors, GoHunt.com forward slash Insider. I want to thank uh, Wilderness Athlete, uh, Western Hunter, uh, Utah Hydrographics, Phone Scope, and the Outdoorsmen for their support. Let's get right to this episode with uh, Donald Trump Jr. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have a special episode with Don Trump Jr. Uh, Don is an avid hunter and fisherman, and I'm really looking forward to talking to him today about uh, his passions for the outdoors. Don, how you doing? I'm doing well, Jay. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm sitting here in Scottsdale, Arizona today, and it's 
Oh, it's actually probably in the 80s, a beautiful day. Where where have we found you today? Well, I'm actually in my office in New York City right now, so uh, it's not quite in the 80s, but it's unseasonably warm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Don, I want to ask you some questions in regards to hunting and fishing. Um, I love everything there is about hunting and fishing and all sorts of 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 each and um i i wanted to to get down to where did you uh get your love for the outdoors and and hunting and fishing where did it originate well it originated from my grandfather uh my grandfather was a you know an electrician a blue collar guy from what was then you know communist czechoslovakia so late 70s early 80s um and when he came over to visit us, he saw how lucky we were to live in, you know, our family, how fortunate we were in many respects uh, to have so much. But he also saw the pitfalls of that. And so he discussed with my father uh, pretty extensively, making sure that I you know, saw the corollary to that. So from a really young age, I would spend six to eight weeks every summer with him. And, and again, communist Czechoslovakia. And it was there's the woods. I'll see you at dark. And so I just I fell in love with the woods, being outdoorsy. Uh, you know, hunting over there was really very much an elitist sport, so it wasn't so much that, but it was, uh, you know, going through the woods, uh, you know, picking mushrooms, uh, doing some little fishing. He told me I shoot an air gun, I had to shoot a bow. Uh, you know, got me started, and I just, you know, I fell in love with it, and I read every book there was to uh, read about it, and whenever I had an opportunity to, you know, grab a mentor or someone who would, you know, take me into the field or teach me something else I didn't know, uh, I took it, and I wasn't afraid to ask and to to learn, and uh, it just evolved from there. And, you know, every weekend I'm either shooting, hunting, fishing, whatever it may be, we're we're always doing something. I don't think I've spent a a weekend in New York City in 10 years, even though I live here during the week. Yeah, I'm sure it's um, quite a contrast between, uh, you know, what people call the greatest city in the world and all of what the city has to offer and then being able to get out. And so as a child uh, growing up, uh, you felt like going away in the summers and being able to just pretty much live a completely different lifestyle. Uh, was it was it the actual lifestyle that drew to you or was it the calmness or, or you know, the quiet of, of, of getting out in the woods? I think it's probably all of the above, right? I mean, it is the lifestyle, and I very much live that lifestyle. Like I said, I mean, I've literally not spent a weekend in New York City in a decade. If I have a friend's wedding, I'll come in and go back out to the country. And so we make it a big part of our lifestyle, and I want to make sure that the great benefits of the outdoors and the time around a campfire and you know everything in between, that those kind of things are there for my kids, and they experience that. I don't want my kids to be you know, just city kids. If they want to do those things and they want to appreciate, that's great, but I want to make sure they see the other side. And uh, it was such an important part of growing up for me and probably being in a duck blind or in a tree stand or whatever it was at, you know, four in the morning made it a little bit harder for me to uh, get into all sorts of other trouble uh, the night before. And it it was so good for me that if I can get a kid off a couch and away from video games and into the woods, I'm doing them a major service. So, you know, I like to talk about the outdoors and what it's meant for me in my lifespan because, Again, it's it's kept me out of a lot of other trouble I would have gotten into. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I'd like to ask you some questions about fishing first. Uh, I I love to fish. I've loved to fish ever since I was a little kid. And, um, you know, probably when I became a teenager is when I really, uh, into my late teens, really enjoyed fly fishing. Mm-hmm. Um uh, and uh, what kind of fishing do you enjoy most? And maybe what have you done the most? And uh, you know what other, what what are all the types of fishing that that you do? Well, but with both fishing and hunting, I sort of do it all. I you know I I, I do a lot of fly fishing. I have a cabin on the East Branch of the Delaware River, which is probably uh, some of the best fishing, certainly on the East Coast, if not you know the country. You don't have, you don't have the the fish quantities that you have out west, but the technical nature of it is incredible. So I love doing that. I'm I'd say I'm the first graduate of the Wharton School of Finance to move to Colorado to be a bartender for almost two years, so I could, so I could fish when I was young and enjoy that and you know fish and bow hunt and and all of that. So I, I do a lot of fly fishing, but even in high school I used to work on deep sea boats uh, on the weekends to make a couple extra bucks, you know, rigging baits and doing it all. So uh, I'd like to think I'm a jack of all trades when it comes to it. I, I, I do have a certain affinity to fly fishing, but as I've gotten older and now that I have kids. 
uh, and young kids, I've become much less of a fly snob, and sometimes it's more about, hey, let's get the kids out and let's just make sure we can catch something. I used to be of the mindset that, you know, I would much rather catch one fish on a fly than 25 on conventional tackle, and uh, I've probably evolved a little bit away from that now because, again, it, you know, showing the kids a good time is, I think, paramount in getting them into it. So uh, I, I go a little bit more for the instant gratification at times, but, no, I still do a lot of fly fishing. I travel all over the country and really all over the world uh, to fish and to hunt, and you know, I, I love it all. I tie my own flies. Like I said, my weekend place is a cabin on the east branch of the Delaware, so I, I, I love the lifestyle and I live it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, it sounds like uh, the, the what'd you say, the East Fork of the Delaware? So the, is that the East Branch of the Delaware River up in the Catskills in New York, sort of the, the home of American fly fishing? Uh, absolutely. And so, you know, some real famous waters. You know, it's where uh, Lee Wolf and Joan Wolf, where they started off their fishing schools and everything like that. So I actually, my, my property is something that Lee Wolf used to own. Uh, you know, where I live up there, it's just a you know amazing place and we like to get away up there and uh you know there's a little pond and i take the kids out there just fishing for you know bluegill and perch and stuff like that whenever uh i'm off you know the actual river and uh we just have a great time and so i assume that the river that you're fishing it's a trout fishery um but what i've heard about some of those trout fisheries is the trout uh, can be very uh, meticulous and very picky. So Correct. I would I would assume because of the nature of those fish and how uh, you know how technical you have to be, I would assume you've been able to hone your skill on on those fish. Yeah, listen, when you when you can catch fish on those rivers, it makes going out west a real joy because uh, you you can have those days as you know my my friends who are guides and you know I have a clack of craft and we you know we we float the river and all you know every weekend I'm up there and. Uh, you know, my my friends who are guides up there joke when talking to their clients about what their expectations to be is just basically expect to catch nothing. That way you will never be disappointed. It's you know, it's <laughs> not like going out west where you know if you get a 20 fish day you're sort of saying oh it was an average day it wasn't really spectacular something it was slow. Uh, you know it, it's a lot different when you do get into fish. There's some really nice wild fish up there. They're very picky, very selective, uh, and you know our our animological like you know life cycle there there's there's so many different insects often hatching simultaneously when you're talking about the aquatic life forms and you know what phase they're in in the hatch uh it, it's less of the you know sort of out west blanket hatch where there's really one thing going on and you're stymied by quantity of bugs with us there could be five hatches going on and they're keying in on some random thing that you're not even seeing uh and and you got to figure that out so it's it's a really technical fishery but it it's very gratifying when you when you figure it out yeah, for sure. I've been in those situations where, you know, you're seeing all sorts of caddis or you're seeing stoneflies and you're, there's fish rising and you actually can't catch a fish and you can't figure it out. And it's not until you realize that, you know, they're taking a size, you know, 18 blueing dollars. Oh, 18. I, you know, they're taking a size 24 trico and you're saying, yeah. you're seeing everything yeah. else going on. I mean, I've had that happen to me on more than one occasion. And uh, you know, it's great, but it, it's a it's an incredible fishery, and it's uh, it, it's ho it's my home water, so I love it. But like I said, I, I lived out west for a year and a half. I fished, you know, I probably spent more than half a year living in the back of my truck, fishing all of the major rivers out west, and I still love you know getting out there whenever I can. Uh, you know, it, it's a real uh, passion of mine, so I, I just love it all. That's awesome. Is the fishery there, uh, your fishery, is it primarily the wild fish? Are they brown trout? or, or Yeah, yeah they a lot of brown. Wild... You do have some rainbows, uh, a, a lot of brown. Um, and then as you go further downriver, where you start getting you know, out of the uh, out of the tailwater sections and the water gets a little bit warmer, it's actually a phenomenal smallmouth fishery if you want to do that. So uh, you, have some, you have some pretty good options. And uh, you know, during waterfowl season, it's always fun to do the cast and blast out of a drift boat and <laughs> Uh, we do it all. That's awesome. What are the what would you say the biggest hatch of the year is um, there on your river? Like you know, what is the monumental hatch that everybody shows up for? I'd say it's the Hendrickson hatch, sort of that you know early May, mid May sort of thing. I mean that that is an epic. You know, if you want to talk about sort of an East Coast blanket hatch, you you can get that there. Uh, you know, sulfurs you know, have a really good hatch, but it's a little bit you know, oftentimes more sporadic, a little bit. It's a much longer season. I can fish sulfurs, uh, you know, for most of the summer. Uh, you know, that the, the green drakes, is, it's sort of maybe a week 
uh, where it can be epic and you're fishing that sort of green drake coffin fly hatch at night. Uh, that that is epic, but you just got to time it right. I mean, water conditions have to be perfect. Everything has to be good, or otherwise, you know, it may happen. But it's going to happen on a Tuesday night, some random day, and you know, by the time you get up there, the following Friday, Saturday could be over. Uh, when you do time that, you know, that's incredible because there's nothing quite like throwing a size eight dry fly, uh, you know, in the dark and just you know, basically fishing from sound. Uh, you know, it, it's just a lot of fun. But uh, I, I'd say the Hendrickson hatch is pretty pretty incredible, and when you time that right, it can be awesome. Yeah, for sure. Um, we, my home water there in Carbondale, Colorado. I spend the summers in Carbondale. Oh, yeah, I, I know all that. You know, like I said, I, I lived in Aspen, so uh, I, I love it all. Uh, the frying pan, the Roaring Fork, all there, the Crystal River up there, just awesome fishery. Yeah, so I mean, the Green Drake hatch, kind of on the Roaring Fork and on the frying pan, is kind of our our uh, big hatch yep. that we look forward to. But, you know, we have incredible um, caddis hatches and just it's an oh, yeah. outstanding fishery. And we float from, you know, just below Aspen there uh, from Woody Creek Bridge all the way down to the confluence of the Colorado. And I know those, even on on down, it's great water, isn't it? I, I know those waters well. And there's nothing like when you time that green drake to hatch when it's going simultaneously with the PMDs and you're just fishing a, you know, a, a double rig uh, with both of them. And it's it just awesome. Awesome yeah, it is. It is. Um, so you obviously like dry fly fishing. No, no, I'm not a snob of... at all. I, I love getting. You know, <laughs> I, I fish where the fish are. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I would rather catch fish than do it in a purist sort of sense. So, you know, I, I do love that hatch. But you know, I, I spend a lot of time. I've spent probably ninety percent of my time nymphing. If they're not visible on the surface, I don't spend a lot of time searching uh, with dry flies. I would much rather. Uh, I have no issue fishing a nymph rig, you know, either conventional indicator rig. I spent a lot of time Euro nymphing, you know, pocket water, certainly in the summer. Uh, spent quite a bit. I, I wrote the forward to George Daniels' uh, new book on streamer fishing. He's just, you know, probably the best fly fisherman uh, I know. Uh, I fish I fish whatever method I think I'm going to catch the most fish on. So, you know, whether it's wet flies, whether it's, you know, ripping streamers in high water, whether it's, you know, dries or nymphing, you know, wh whatever's working, I'm fishing. Yeah, that, I was going to ask you. I'm a bit of a streamer junkie myself. Uh, I love fish and dries, but I, there's just something about, you know, I love nymphing too, but uh, something about streamers in the right conditions. Oh, yeah. Uh, big fish chasing streamers and, you know, yanking the streamer right out of their mouth. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a technique all on its own to um, be able to fish streamers. Uh, 100%. Well, that's cool. And there's a lot there. I mean, there's, you know, there's, it's not just ripping them from a drift boat. It's you know fishing them in a, a lot of unconventional ways. And you know I learned a lot from George that way. And he's you know phenomenal author, incredible fisherman. And so uh, you know his book that I had the pleasure of writing the forward to is you know it's just awesome as it relates to that. And just opens up a whole new mindset as it relates to streamer fishing as well. So it's it's great. Absolutely. Um, have you done much uh, saltwater fly fishing? Oh yeah. Uh, you know, I grew up in the Long Island Sound in Connecticut on the weekend. So. You know, I had a Boston whaler, and I mean, I, I was, I was saltwater fly fishing in the you know early '90s before it was really a big deal. Uh, so you know, I've caught everything from, you know, bonefish, stripers, tarpon, sailfish, marlin, tuna, all on a fly rod. So you know, even bluefin. Um, so you know, I, I've done it all with a fly rod because there was a time in my life where I was sort of a fly purist, and I would go out there and I would just try to figure out how to. Uh, how to do everything on a fly. Uh, I've probably evolved away from that other than trout fishing where I still do, you know, all of my stuff trout is uh, with a fly. But, you know, I, I do it all. If I bring a fly rod, if the opportunity presents itself, awesome. Uh, if it doesn't, I'm I'm just as comfortable with, you know, bait bait casting gear or, you know, fishing surf. Whatever it takes. What, whatever it takes. Have fun. Yeah, absolutely. I hear that striper bite up there can be unbelievable if you hit it right. Oh, it's awesome. I mean, last summer I, I finally... I finally caught Walter, you know, that fish I've been chasing for my entire <laughs> childhood. I caught a 50 pound striper on, on an eight pound braid with a, with a top water plug. Uh, it, I actually, I was fishing off of a Martha's vineyard with, with a guy that's just an awesome guy, a good friend of mine, uh, Joe LeClaire. And, uh, we were up there and, you know, I, I put the fly gear away cause it was gale force winds and it was just blowing. And I was like, you know what? I'm just getting beat up. There's no, not worth it. Took the, took the popper rod and just, cast my second cast just two feet off the shore in this gale you just saw this explosion i knew right away it was a massive fish and uh like the smart ones do he started wrapping me around sort of the the i'm not gonna call them coral heads because it's up north but the big rock heads 
uh, you know, off the beach. I just threw my phone to my friend and I was like, he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm not letting that fish go. So I jumped in because I felt, you know, I felt the line rubbing. So I jumped in and swam to sort of unwind him from the rock so he wouldn't uh, break me off. And I just landed him in open water. <laughs> I saw that plug with all the hooks in there and I saw this big fish. I'm like, well, I'm just going to stick my hand in his mouth and hope that I don't get hooked to the plug with him on the other end pulling. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we, we we got him on. We had a certified scale in the boat, went 50 pounds. And a, and a few ounces would have been a, a line class world record, but I, you know, that was a big mama fish. I wanted to let her go to make sure that uh, she makes some more baby fish. So even though I broke the record by about eight pounds and we knew it, uh, we, we opted to let her go and, uh, and make some more baby big bass. That's awesome. That's a great story. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. At GoHunt.com, we are restoring the heritage of the old and constantly redefining the new. We stay focused and put our efforts into redefining the future of Western hunting. What makes us special? What makes us different? We are the new breed of hunter. We are the customers that we serve. We are the innovators and we are the future. Visit GoHunt.com slash insider and join the movement. Use the J. Scott promo code when signing up and receive a $50 Kuyu gift card. Since 1982, the Outdoorsman's in Phoenix has made it their goal to provide the very best customer service combined with the latest and greatest optics and accessories in the business. Outdoorsman's is the leading designer and manufacturer of high-quality tripods and mounting accessories for any hunter's optical needs. Go to Outdoorsman's.com or call 1-800-291-8065 and use the J. Scott promo code until February 28th to receive 10% off all Outdoorsman's packs and pack accessories. Don, that's a great story. Congratulations on catching a fish of that size. Well, I want to want to talk to you about uh, some of your hunting. And um, would you say you fish or hunt more or do both equal? You know, it, it's interesting. I mean, I, I hunt a lot too, and you know, I'm a competitive shooter as well. And I reload, and I probably uh, between my brother and I, we reload for about 150 different calibers. Uh, so, you know, we're pretty serious about all of it. So I, I do a lot. I mean, in the summer I, I fish more and in the fall I hunt a lot more. And then, you know, my, my vacation time isn't really spent going to a beach and sitting there doing nothing. I, you know, I take my, my vacation times going out, you know, to the Yukon doing a sheep hunt or, you know, going, uh, somewhere God knows where, uh, living. In, I, I sort of like the extreme hunting, uh, stuff. And so that, that's how I spend my vacation time. So, you know, I, I think fishing season's a little longer than hunting season, but, you know, during, during our early bow season, which usually starts around October 1st, I'm in a tree stand, you know, or a ground blind uh, every weekend, usually at least, at least both days, uh, sometimes morning and afternoon both days. Uh, if I can get away from the kids, it's been a little bit harder because I have five, you know, kids and I try to get them out as much as possible, but... Uh, you know, sometimes I'll pass on the morning hunt or the afternoon hunt to do to do some family stuff, or even you know take them out to the 3D range and let them shoot some archery and let them, uh, um, you know, fish. So uh, I, I do a lot of it and I, I do well. But I, I can honestly say there's I can't recall a weekend where I haven't either hunted, fished, or shot, uh, you know, pretty extensively in in as long as I can remember. That's fantastic, and um, your whitetail rut is what the first two weeks of November there. Yeah, you know it, it varies a lot, and especially with the weird weather conditions we've had. I mean, I, I, this year we basically didn't even have a rut, as you know, that I could tell. And you know, I spend enough time in the woods. I'll spend enough even mornings in the middle of the week where I'll run up and say, okay, well, I can get two hours in the blind before work, so I'll do it. And this year, it just never got cold till really late. So. Uh, you know, I, I don't think I missed a span of more than four or five days where I wasn't in the woods and I didn't see the usual chasing, the usual, you know, the usual pre-rut stuff that's so heavy. Uh, you know, didn't see much or hear much grunting in the deer that I did. So I still did fine uh, just because I sort of figured out, you know, the good choke points and the places where I can hunt to get, you know, some natural funnels to, to get them to come by. And, I, you know, again, up here, uh, you know, we're lucky if we see a 125, 130 class whitetail. So I do a lot of traditional archery tackle uh, uh, hunting just to make it much more challenging for myself because there's, there's no shortage of deer, but we just don't have great deer. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm still pretty lucky just because I've, I've got it figured out in the places that I do get to hunt, but there wasn't the pronounced rut that we would normally have. Uh, it was really odd. Yeah, it but that, would, that like would normally be good timing, and even a little bit later. Sometimes it goes almost into that third week where uh, you're starting to push into sort of our shotgun season. 
uh, here. Uh, oftentimes you can still see a lot of that activity. But, yeah, I mean, that, that second week would sort of normally be a pretty good call. It's just non-existent this year. Are you kind of like me in that you'll hunt, you know, you'll hunt archery, you'll hunt rifle, you'll hunt whatever, whatever it calls for, whatever the season dictates? A hundred percent. I mean, it, it, if there's a season that's on, it, you know, I, I do it. I mean, you know, archery, uh, early season, I, I hunt a lot of traditional gear, you know, longbows, recurves, uh, that kind of stuff. As it starts getting colder, which wasn't as much of an issue this year, but as it starts to get colder and I have to sort of bulk up a little bit more because I'm going to be in a you know, tree stand for three and a half hours, uh, it gets a little harder for me to shoot that kind of tackle. I just don't shoot it as well when I'm cold and when I'm uh, when I'm bulky in terms of clothing. So I'll switch over to the wheels, um, you know, and switch over to my Hoyt and you know start shooting that compound wise. And then, uh, you know, we we don't have a rifle season per se where I am, uh, other than if I go upstate, you know, real far. But we have a couple other places my brother and I have where we shotgun season. So I'll either hunt shotgun, I'll hunt handguns, I'll you know hunt revolvers, I'll hunt muzzle loader. I, I do it all. That's fantastic. Um, and would you say if you had to, you know, I get people asking me this question all the time. If you had to choose one, Oof. what would, what would you say is your favorite? In terms as far of, as in terms of methodology, well, like yeah. or, or type of hunting. Cause, listen, methodology. I mean, I guess it, it depends because if I could only do one thing ever, it would probably be bow hunting, simply because it's a much longer season, right? I mean, our our rifle seasons maybe you know ten days, two weeks at best. Uh, you know, or, or the shotgun season, so it's, it's a much shorter season, so I would much rather have an extended season. Now, that said, uh, if I'm going to take my, you know, you know two-week vacation and I'm going to go to the Yukon uh, to do a sheep hunt, you know, I'm still at the stage of my life where, you know, uh, if I don't get into that 30, 40, 50-yard kind of range and, uh, you know, being a competitive long-range shooter, I know I'm capable of shooting at some pretty good distances. I'm not at the point where I'm saying, okay, well, I would rather uh, not get anything than not get it with a bow. I'm not there yet, so... Uh, it depends, but you know, I, I do what in my home areas where I know the deer, I know what's going on. I'm I'm out there scouting, have my trail cameras up. You know, my season it's sort of year round. I mean, I'm all, I'm always watching and figuring it out. So uh, I have it down that I do I, I do probably prefer the bow stuff, or you know, again, I'll, I'll hunt revolvers a lot and uh, just try to make it real challenging, make it a proximity game, make it about you know, getting in close and not just you know pulling the trigger. It's it, it's much more hunting than uh, just shooting. But you know, again, if I go down to Texas or out west or whatever, and I'm only going to get to do that once or twice this season, uh, you know, I'll, I'll bring some different kind of firepower down there. Yeah, for sure. You know, for me, hunting, obviously providing food for my family, but I love all of the, you know, strategy and tactical stuff and trying to figure the animal out and trying to figure out the best place to be. And, um, oh, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I think that to me, uh, preparing for the hunts, are you, you do the same type of a hundred percent. I mean, half the fun for me on the hunting is the is the pre-hunt. I mean, I'm I'm not one of these guys that just you know shows up and does guided hunts and stuff. Now, if I go to the Yukon, you know, of course that's a little different. But you know, in at, at home and you know in around here, it's all do it yourself. And I, I mean, I have as much fun. It's so much still part of the lifestyle and part of the culture is you know setting up blinds, cutting shooting lanes, and doing that kind of stuff during the summer prior to the season. I mean, that that makes the season so much more satisfying to me when you figure it out, when you get it right, when you uh, when you, you know, remember to clear that one extra tree that gave you the actual shot that allowed you to take the deer that year that you, uh, you didn't get and, you know, practicing with the trad gear and spending time on a 3d range and shooting for hours, especially with the traditional gear where, you know, it, it really is an art form that takes a long time to, to perfect. Uh, you know, to me, it's all part of it, just like tying my own flies to catch the fish on. And it's just that much more satisfying. So, you know, again, I'm always doing something and, you know, reloading, tweaking my loads to, you know, I'm coming at it usually from a competitive mindset to really get it better. But it also means that, you know, when I'm in the field and I'm I'm shooting well and I'm shooting competitively, I know that I'll be able to make that shot in the field that, uh, you know, is fair uh, and just to, to the animal that I'm I'm chasing after. So uh, to me, it's all encompassing. You know, there, there's no such thing as a season. It's it's all one big season. Uh, it's called the year and it's just what you're doing, even if I'm not necessarily in the field pursuing actual game. Yeah, you know, people ask me in mixed company with my wife, they'll say, you know, what's your favorite animal or what's your favorite season to hunt? And my wife just laughs because she's, you know, her answer is, you know, whatever season it is, that's what he's into at the time. And the nice thing about hunting for me and even fishing is there's always something new and there's always a new season and everything's always changing. And, 
you know, just about the time you get tired of, say, turkey hunting for 30 days or whatever, that all of a sudden it's fishing season and you can just move from season to season. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy about the sporting lifestyle. I, I, you know, I don't know if you've heard me say it before, but you basically took the words right out of my mouth. I mean, that's exactly right. It's, you know, about the time I'm getting bored with, you know, the only problem is that lull that right now, basically, the February and March, where it's like, where, at least where I live, there's nothing in season. There's not a lot of this. Like, I just, I spend a lot of time, I guess, shooting clays and, uh, and, and getting my bows ready for a turkey season coming up for us. It's a little bit later than most places. We're, we're in May. Uh, so, you know, hopefully I'll get down south right now with the campaign and everything. It's a little bit tougher to get away. Uh, but, you know, the turkeys are a calling, and uh, i, I got to get ready for that one now. Absolutely. So is your brother, Eric, uh, every bit as much into it as you are? Yeah, no, he, he he's very into it as well. Uh, you know, I probably spend a little bit more time traveling for it and doing sort of those, you know, destination uh, trips, but he, he's a fanatic as well. He's a phenomenal shooter, uh, incredible clay shooter, um, you know, very gifted that way. Uh, so, so we, I mean, we shoot most weekends together and just have a, have a great time. So yeah, no, we're, we're both, uh, you know, fanatics, you know, we're, we're the guys that you took our gun collections and people started looking at them from the outside, <laughs> sort of wondering what's going on here. So, uh, you know, we're the guys that when they're, when they pull over those people and they try to say, Oh, they had 5,000 rounds of ammo in his car because he, you know, he has a couple bricks of 22. Uh, we're like, what are you talking about? Like we, we would never not have a couple thousand rounds of ammo in the back of our car. It's almost like un- <laughs> unheard of, you know, we, uh, what, what do you mean? It, it, it's, it, we're, we're the case study for that, I guess just a way of life, isn't it? It is. Like I said, for me, it's a hundred percent a lifestyle and I live it and I live it fully. Uh, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, I understand you went on a sheep hunt, uh, recently. Uh, tell me about your gear prep and kind of how physically, how you got in shape and ready for that hunt. Well, you know, in terms of getting in shape, uh, you know, I, I, I'm one of those CrossFit guys. I do it because it pushes me harder than anything else, but I basically do it. So you know, I, I'm the guy in camp. I, if I'm going with someone like that and I'm going that far and going that far out of the way, you know, I want my guy to be like, damn, I can't keep up with you. So that, that's when I know I've done my job when the guy's like, you know, calls you a mountain goat. So uh, I work out hard and it's it's usually so that I can perform in the field. But, you know, gear prep, uh, you know, I guess there's a lot of stuff as it relates to shooting and load development. You know, I, I'm uh, I'm not abject to shooting far, but it's only because I, I shoot competitively. I shoot competitive long range. I shoot competitive high power. Uh, you know, I've, I've got 600 yard you know, range in my backyard on the weekends so that I, just so that I can practice. And, you know, it, it's not about trying to, I am a bow hunter at heart, so I like to get in close, but, you know, I want to know that if I had to shoot out at distance, that it's not even, it's not a question of what's going to happen. It's just, you know, doing it. So, uh, there's a lot of shooting involved with it. We, you know, I shoot thousands of center fire rounds a year, shoot thousands of shotgun rounds. I shoot, you know, more 22 than you can even imagine just, you know, uh, for finesse and for practice and with the kids. Uh, you know, gear wise, uh, huge fan of the Kuyu, uh, stuff. It's light, it's warm, it's, uh, incredibly functional. Um, you know, Jason Hairstrand's become a good friend of mine. He's done an amazing job building up that business and it's just a, you know, phenomenal, phenomenal gear. Uh, he's a great guy. He's been really, you know, he was very helpful to me even before we became friendly. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he just has an you know, incredible all round product for anything you'd want. Uh, you know, for that kind of hunting. And, you know, again, if I'm going to take my vacation, uh, which I'd like to believe is pretty hard earned and I'm, that's going to be my only vacation that year, other than maybe a couple of long weekend trips with the kids and I'm going to do it. I want good gear and, uh, he makes the best as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. Um, so have you completed your grand slam of sheep yet, or are you still working on that? Still working on it. Uh, you know, I have a, uh, I have a really nice doll. I have a, I, yeah, I have a world-class uh, desert, um, you know, 187 and 58. So uh, goodness, yeah, wow, a really solid desert. Uh, you know, funny story. Also, I mean, I, I basically got it by dumb luck. Uh, not not because of the hunt. We worked hard for it, but uh, I, I was literally invited by some friends of mine I met on a business trip. We were I was on a business trip looking at a resort development type of deal uh, in Mexico, and we were at this dinner, you know, business dinner you know, talking off and somehow hunting came up and they saw my eyes perk up and they were like, wait a minute, you're a hunter. And, uh, all of a sudden I found that they're hunters and they had a huge ranch in Sonora and, uh, became good buddies with the guys. They're like, well, what are you doing this weekend? I was like, I don't know. It was November. I'm going to go sit in a tree stand in New York. But the prospect of uh, chasing a big mule deer, uh, in Sonora was a lot cooler than, uh, 
was a lot cooler than small whitetail in New York. So uh, went out with, you know, these guys now without any gear, borrowed a bow. My borrowed my friend's dad's bow, fit me perfectly. His, you know, his 20 yard pin was basically 25 yards for me. The way I was shooting it, you know, went out and in one weekend I shot a 217 mule deer by Dunlock man. Just, you know, I was seeing. Uh, you know, just sitting over a food plot, I was seeing deer that were, you know, by my standards, huge, you know, 160s, 170s, 180s. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just waited a little bit longer, even though I didn't have much time and, you know, saw this mule deer come on. I just saw that shoulder. and I was like, oh my God, it's just a massive, massive mule deer. So a 217 mule deer with a bow. And I just became <laughs> with these guys. So the following year, they're like, Hey, you want to come back down? I was like, yeah, uh, yeah, I do. Uh, I, I do, uh, you know, chase some coos, chase, you know, and about two weeks before the hunt, they call me and they say, hey, uh, what's your address? I was like, here, why? Well, we need it for the CITES permit. I was like, well, I've hunted mule deer now in Mexico and Coos, and I've never needed a CITES permit. Like, what, what for? They're like, ah, we, they gave us a sheep tag on our place. It's yours if you want it. <laughs> so <laughs> and two weeks later, I'm chasing desert sheep in Sonora as, you know, just a gift from my friends. They say, hey, well, you, you want an extra tag that we had? And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, at the time, it probably would have been one of the, top 10 in the world. So it was just, you know, awesome experience. Yeah. This summer I did a, uh, they shot actually a Fannin, uh, sort of a, a doll stone hybrid. Uh, so I guess theoretically I got three of the four. So I need a, I need a good bighorn, Rocky mountain bighorn. Right. right on. Well, the quest I know for many on the grand slam is something that, uh, people will obviously never forget the rest of their life. And I've had a few friends that have completed it. And so, um, yeah, I wish you the best of success in, in you. your, yeah, in your and, pursuit for that. And, and the sheep, I just, I love it because it's just so man versus nature. It's, you know, the hunt, the, the, the excruciating efforts, you know, I know what I went through this summer is just, uh, you know, and, and, you know, my guide was an awesome guy, Mark London, the uh, incredible guy, uh, tough in shape. It was great. And he was sort of, again, you never know, I guess, you know, he'd seen enough about me to say, Hey, he talks a good game, but can he, can he actually hold his own? So, uh, you know, he took me in some pretty tough spots at first. It was like, okay, that was a test. You're good. Let's go. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, we, we just had an amazing hunt through some incredible terrain. And, uh, you know, I love it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm still, you know, I'll still chase sheep, even the ones I got. It's not just about getting the slam. I just, I, I love being out in, in, in that setting more than probably anything else right now. And I've got quite a bit of experience in Africa. I got quite a bit of experience all over, uh, you know, all over the Americas. And, you know, that, that's still probably my favorite right now. If I could just do, you know, one, one major trip type of hunt a year, it would, it would definitely still be sheep. And I, I think the thing that, you know, I guide for a uh, desert bighorn. And I, I think the thing that people are so intrigued with is, you know, it, it, it it's a true test. It's a tr test mentally. It's a test physically. Uh, there's a lot of adventure. There's a lot of things that go wrong. And I think you learn a lot about yourself uh, when you go on some of those wild hunts that, you know, it's, it's, it's just completely wild. It's a complete adventure. You know, sometimes just getting an animal is a huge feat in itself. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, not to mention a, a you know, a trophy animal. Yep. Um, one of the questions I was going to ask you is we talk a lot about on my podcast and other episodes, and we get this question a lot about, you know, trophy hunting as opposed to, you know, uh, hunting for food for your, for your family and to eat and what have you. And I, I look at both of them as they're, they're, they're kind of the same in that yeah. it's just hunting. And I, I, I was I agree. curious. I, what's yeah, your... I hate when they grow. Oh, you're only a trophy hunter. It's like, really? That, uh, you know, that doesn't talk about the, you know, three doe I shot this year for meat. And, you know, if, if I can get something, you know, that's bigger and it is, you know, what we, you know, what some may judge as trophy potential, you know, you know, that's great. It's just another bonus. It just means I'm hunting that much harder trying to figure that out and playing that game. Uh, you know, but I, I don't think I've ever shot anything that hasn't been eaten or been fully utilized, uh, you know, w whatever that may be, whether it's, you know, here or abroad or in Africa. Uh, you know, I, I have done plenty of meat hunting as well, but, you know, the underlying principle is it's always going to get eaten. I wouldn't be doing it if, it if that wasn't the case. And, you know, we eat a lot of venison in my household. I like to prepare it. I, you know, I mean, I literally have places and processing places where I just I fall in love with the way these guys make, you know, a tamale or the, these guys make you know, the best you know, sweet sausage or hot sausage. And there's places in Texas that just do a great job with certain, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I literally will go down there to shoot a doe to be like, hey, I, I, I want, you know, X pounds of jerky and this from, you know, one place. It's, uh, you know, I, I love the meat and I, I think. 
too many people try to make that distinction between trophy hunting and not. And frankly, for me, some of the best trophies uh, in my mind that I've ever shot are not trophies by any standard of the imagination in terms of, you know, the guys, you know, chasing horn and, and uh, uh, just, you know, score. It was just because the hunt had that much more effort or we put that much time into it or it was, you know, I, I remember li- when I lived out west when it was me and three buddies, you know, both were all young and in great shape. They were two U.S. ski team guys and, you know, we're living in Colorado and, you know, the three of us worked as like a tag team pair uh, elk hunting public land with a bow and all three of us got our elk, you know, by the end of the season. It took us 28 days, you know, packing everyone's stuff out, getting in there, calling for people, to, you know, but it was tens of thousands of vertical feet a day uh, to do it. And the effort, you know, they shot a, you know, crappy raghorn in the end. And you know what? It was one of the greatest trophies of my life because it was so much work and it was such a memorable experience. Uh, it, it, again, it wasn't any kind of book. It wasn't anything. It wouldn't, it wouldn't even qualify. Uh, but it was, it was, again, about the experience and, and the work and the, the camaraderie that you made, you know, on, on this kind of, you know, brutal, grueling journey. Yeah, for sure. Let's take a quick break here to hear from our sponsors. Have you guys heard about PhoneScope? PhoneScope is a privately held company that makes custom molded, precisely engineered smartphone digiscoping adapters. Photographing wildlife has never been easier. Take digiscoping photos and videos from your smartphone and share them with your friends. PhoneScope stands behind their product with a 100% money back guarantee. PhoneScope is the future of digiscoping. Get yours now. Use the JScott16 promo code and receive 10% discount on all purchases. Check them out at Phonescope, that's P-H-O-N-E-S-K-O-P-E dot com, or on Instagram, at Phonescope. Wilderness Athlete is committed to improving the health and quality of life for the outdoor athlete by providing field-tested, scientifically validated nutrition and sports performance products. Check them out at wildernessathlete.com and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off any order in February 2016. Don, I want to shift a little bit to talk to you about uh, some business stuff and ask you, I'm in the real estate business as well, and I I got in in 1997 when I graduated from college, Um, and I would ask you, do you like real estate as much as your father does? It's an interesting question. I, you know, I like talking about hunting a lot more than I do about real estate. <laughs> Can we go back to the other stuff? No, uh, I, I do. I, I like it a lot. I don't know if anyone likes real estate as much as my father does. You know, I, I wouldn't do something as as you know voraciously as I do you know my work if I didn't enjoy it and appreciate it. But um, you know, he he is a you know he's a work all the time kind of guy. I mean, he has fun and he does it. But you know, he's a big golfer, but. He plays golf on the courses that he owns so that he can tweak them and constantly improve them and make them better. Uh, you know, I'm able to, and I, I choose to, uh, decompress a little bit more. And so my, my personal life, what I do in the outdoors is just the antithesis of what my work week is like. And so I, I'm able to separate the two, uh, you know, very abruptly and very effectively. Uh, for him, it's a little different. I mean, he's sort of a constant worker. That's what, you know, but that's, that's his passion. That's his lifestyle. That's you know his vocation. Is his is his passion. Uh, is his work, uh, and so it makes it easier to do that. I, I I do love what I do. I do really enjoy, especially real estate and the creative aspects of it. But uh, you know when I when I'm on when I'm in a tree stand, I, I'm I'm thinking about hunting and and being in the woods, not so much work. So in other words, when you work, you work hard, but then you're able to turn it off and you're able to focus on the strategy and the pinch points and the different trees that you should be in. And, and then you go all in in that uh, and you're able to kind of shut it on and off. Yeah, the, the, I think it's a fair assessment. I think today with you know mobile technology, it's a little harder to get away. I mean, I, it, it, it is difficult for me to, you know, if I know there's incoming coming in and I'm sitting there and I haven't seen anything for a while, I, you know, uh, I, I probably preferred it before the advent of the iPhone uh, you know, years ago where you, you'd actually sit in a tree stand and you didn't have the option of even looking. But uh, so I, I probably cheat a little bit and do a little bit of work out of, uh, you know, the stand. But, no, I, I do try to really separate the two. For sure. How do you see technology changing, you know, the the actual business relationship um, today? It just seems as the personal touch is 
we've we've lost sight of that a little bit. How do you see technology changing business? Well, I mean that, that that's certainly the case. You see it with you know people that are just virtually incapable of actually communicating outside of you know using multiple emojis to express their emotions. Uh, it, you know that, that's a little bit disconcerting because I mean I think interpersonal relationships, networking, and that ability is so important for business. Uh, it's it's what I love about the outdoors because oftentimes again it does force you to sort of uh, remove at least most layers of you know of that communication and it forces you to have a real conversation so um, you know that's important but you know at, at the same time I think uh, you know given what I do and what I have to do and uh, you know, being able to communicate and being able to do it that way uh, is also advantageous to me being able to do what I want to be doing in my free time so. Uh, yeah, you sort of have to take the good with the bad. Yeah, I, I can do 90% of what I need to do from anywhere in the world uh, with my sat phone if I need to. So, uh, you know, that's kind of convenient and it allows me to do uh, and take, you know, sort of adventures that I wouldn't otherwise perhaps be able to do if I didn't have that direct access because it's hard to be gone for weeks at a time when you're running the kind of business we are. So uh, I guess you have to take the good with the bad in that one. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, before uh, I got on the conversation with you, I was looking through uh, the, the Trump website and uh, came across a couple videos that were really good with you and your brother and your sister. And um, there was uh, some talk about building the brand and maintaining the, the Trump brand. Yes. Um, what kind of advice would you give to people out there that are starting their own businesses no matter what type of business, how do you how do you build a brand, and what are the key ingredients to a, you know to being a successful brand? Well, listen, for for brand, it's all about consistency, right? You have to be true to your message. You have to be consistent to that message. So, um, you know, that that's not always easy to do because you you have to be on point all the time. I mean, one little mistake in a brand, and you know, it, all, all the work you've done for a long time uh, can can be over. Now, we've been very lucky in that. Uh, you know, we've been able to step in and sort of more be stewards of a brand that my father created and spent 30 years creating. So you know, our job is a little different than his. We, we're a little uh, less risk averse. And frankly, he's less risk averse now because he's created what it is that he's created. But there was a time where, uh, you know, it, it, you had to take those kind of risks to be able to uh, achieve what he's achieved. Uh, we look at it differently. We have to be a lot more cautious, a lot more uh, just, you know, protectors of the brand rather than, uh, going all in sort of on innovating or trying to alter or change or grow. Um, you know, so our job is, is a lot different than his was when he was our age. Um, but, you know, it, again, it's still about the brand at all times. I want to ask you a few questions about politics. And I think I've been watching the um, the campaign here uh, very closely. And it it uh, why do you think that your dad resonates uh so much with so many Americans? Well, honestly, I, I think because he's not a politician, he's he's someone who has actually employed people. You know, all these other guys, they talk about job creation. You know, they've never hired anyone in their lives. They've literally never once had someone's well-being, their family's livelihoods, uh, you know, dependent on their success. And my father's been doing that for 40 years. He's had tens of thousands of people dependent on him showing up, being successful, winning uh, you know, uh, he he resonates with people. He's talking with people. He's saying the things that they're thinking. He's not talking at them. I feel like so many of the other people in the field, they're you know sort of they're academics. They're talking about theory, but they've never done any of it in practice. Uh, and you know, I think you know he's talking to also you know hardworking blue collar Americans. Those are people who have been forgotten these days. I mean, if you're not some sort of like special you know demographic of whatever you, you know. You know, you're the actual people who built this country. You're the people who made this country great. And those are people that politicians don't even think about, don't even cater to anymore. So he's, you know, he's talking to the people that are hardworking Americans that made the country what it is, uh, and he's giving them a voice again. And I think that's unique. So many politicians, they, you know, they run through their databases of what they need to tell people so they get their vote. And then all of a sudden, you know, when it comes time, to, you know, when the rubber meets the road, they do whatever their special interests want. And I think people are sick of it. They're uh, they're excited about someone giving them a voice, and I think my father's message is just resonating them, with them very clearly. Yeah, and I think uh, funding his own campaign and not being subject to, you know, the lobbyists and not being subject to anybody running him like a puppet, I think, is another huge 
uh, thing. Can you speak to that somewhat? Uh, that's right. I think 100 percent. I mean, he's risking, you know, these other guys and you see it. And that's what's so disingenuous about all the attack ads that you see now. You know, you have some guy who, you know, contributed 10 million dollars to someone else's campaign so that when, you know, when the time comes, he'll call in his favor to make sure he secures a contract, even though he doesn't deserve it. Uh, you know, my father's funding his own campaign and spending his money wisely because he wants America to know, like, hey, I'm not beholden to anyone. I'm going to do what's right for the people for a change. Now, it's hard to believe we're even having this conversation, but that's what it's become. You know, there's zero thought about the American people and certainly the hardworking people of this country. Uh, it, it's all about everyone else and catering to this. And God forbid we uh, you know, offend this you know, demographic that makes up 0.0002% of the populace. Uh, you know, that's not the way my father speaks. I mean, he speaks from the gut. He speaks from the heart. Uh, he doesn't hold back. Uh, and because of that, he's actually forcing real conversation to be had. You know, everyone pretends, oh, we don't have a problem with this. We don't have a problem with it. Well, we do have a problem with it, and we got to talk about it. And just because it may not be nice, uh, you know, and the problems are serious problems, so we have to have the conversation. We can't just bury our head in the sand and pretend that there's not an issue there. And politicians have got away with that so much, but if you look at the major issues that are playing out in this race – they're issues that were taboo to even talk about, but my father sort of said, hey, here's the problem, and you know, he can be diplomatic. I've seen him do deals all over the world with people from all different cultural backgrounds, all different ethnicities, all different you know, uh, personalities. You know, he can do that and do deals that are favorable to him on his terms, but he's also the first guy to admit that, hey, and sometimes you have to break out the hammer. Sometimes you have to beat something over someone's head when there's a real problem. You just can't pretend that it is because – uh, you know, we want to look at the world through rose-colored glasses. And so I think people get it, and he's, he's opening their eyes to, to how the world really functions here. If your father were to be elected president of the United States, um, what should sportsmen know um, about, I guess, if you know, from a sportsman's perspective, how do you think he will help sportsmen? Well, listen, he's been, you know, as it relates to sportsmen, uh, you know, obviously, you know, the big joke over the holidays was, you know, the only job in government that I would ever want would be the Department of Interior because I want to make sure that our public lands stay public, that, you know, I, I, can, I can see some aspects where the state may get a little bit more involved, but they're going to remain public. It's not going to be something where the state can sell it off to fund their shortfall so they can run up deficits and, and sportsmen are left out in the dust. It's going to be about making sure that that kind of access to the public uh, to the great lands, and you know, so we can continue the amazing sporting traditions of this country. Uh, you know, so my father said the only job I would ever do would be literally the Department of Interior, and I, I'd make sure to be involved in that. And between my brother and I, we're going to be the voice in his ear screaming about those kind of issues. So uh, he'll be the best guy for sportsmen since Teddy Roosevelt, uh, because you know it is such a passion of ours, and he gets it. And frankly, you know, the Second Amendment is a big part of that. A because of the freedom aspect. B because uh, you know access to firearms is. You know, and, and as complicated as they're trying to make it, that's going to be the end of sportsmen when they make it very difficult to purchase firearms. And he's the guy that's taken controversial positions on firearms. You know, in, in the wake of San Bernardino, in the wake of Paris, he's you know when everyone else who's so pro Second Amendment, they're crickets. You know, now they've done their one obligatory photo shoot, you know, with, with their finger on the trigger on a gun with the safety off. You know, so it looks like they know what they're actually doing, but they don't. Um, you know, he's the only guy saying, hey, you know what, if bullets were flying the other way, California and Paris, where you have the toughest gun laws in the world, like the only people that are going to obey those laws are law-abiding citizens. The criminals are still going to do it. If there were bullets flying the other way, maybe you'd have a different end result. So even the other guys that are, you know, quote, unquote, pro-Second Amendment, they're not going to say those things. They're crickets when, it, when a real controversy comes out. My father's not afraid to have those conversations. So, uh, you yeah, know, I think he's going to be incredible for the Second Amendment. I think he's going to be incredible for concealed carry. Uh, you, you can make sure that I'm going to be the loud and obnoxious voice in his ear, making sure that those things get done. Uh, and as it relates to sportsmen, we're going to take care of our public lands, make sure that they stay public. Uh, in some cases, maybe the state gets involved in terms of management because certain states, I know certainly Utah and some of the other states, you know, have done a good job. But you know, any, any kind of thing where the state's going to be back involved, it's not going to be so they can sell off those lands to fund shortfalls, uh, you know, in their budgets uh, and you know the great public lands that we have and have access to. Uh, are going to wither away. That's never going to happen under my watch. Love it, love it. That's um, I, I wanted to make have you make that very clear, and you obviously made that clear. Uh, I want to thank you for being on with us today, and uh, I just want to finish with one last question, and that is, um, with all the busyness that you have with business, and you've got a big family and five kids, and the sporting life that that. Uh, that we enjoy and that you enjoy, 
Um, how do you balance that? Honestly, you just have to make time for it. Yeah, you have to make time for it. Uh, I, I've gotten to the point in my career, you know, where uh, you know it, it's not just about doing the next deal. And you know, I, I, there was a time in my life where I said, okay, well, I'm going to cancel that hunting trip, and you know, then you end up sitting there, and nothing happens because it looked like you were going to close a deal. So you, you just have to make the time for it all. And uh, you know, family. Uh, you know, self, uh, the outdoors, I sort of group it in there with, with both of those things. That's really important to me. It allows me to be stable. And if I'm, if I'm satisfied in that life, uh, I'm more efficient in my work life. And so you just have to make the time. I mean, the, I don't think anyone's ever been on their deathbed saying, you know, I wish I made one more deal. I don't think that's ever, I don't think that's ever gone through someone else's mind. So you, you just have to make the time and do it. Awesome. That's a great way to answer that question. Um, and I've got turkey season coming up here, April and May. Uh, really looking forward to. We're going to hunt some Merriams, and nice. I do Gould's turkey hunts down in Mexico. Uh, what uh, What do you have coming up? Well, I got Easter's coming up in uh, you know May first, so I'm, I'm going to hope to try to get down to uh, with some friends down in Georgia. Their, their season starts a little bit earlier. May get down to Texas uh, to do it if I can if I can pull away from the campaign trail. That's the real problem right now. Is the campaign's really screwing me up as it relates to. Uh, <laughs> uh, those those seasons right now, um, but you know me, I'll, I'll I'll always make the effort, and I always you know e- even if it's sort of last minute, I have so many friends that know I'm into it, and they're you know they have places or they're 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 big into it and passionate about it, and they're they'll call me up, be like, hey, I know it's last minute, but you want to come to a turkey hunt this weekend? I'll I'll get on a plane and make it happen. So, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm sure I'll have some uh, some good turkey stories for you within the next few weeks. That's great. I saw when you guys were in Iowa, it looked like you and your brother went out. It looked like a pheasant hunt or something while you were there. So you, you uh, got some hunting in even on the campaign trail. Yeah, listen, you know, that, that's the great thing about the campaign trail. You know, obviously in business, being a hunter and stuff can be a little bit more controversial. But, you know, now that we're in politics and we're, you know, certainly conservative, uh, it's feel like, you know, I, I can come out of the closet. I can talk about it. Yeah, I'm a hunter. And I'm proud of it. I, you know, it, it, uh, so, uh, you know, unlike so many people that I know in, you know, in New York city that are big hunters, you know, big and serious hunters, but they can't even talk about it. It's, it's always interesting. There's, you know, there's guys I've known for, you know, decades. Uh, and until I sort of become, started becoming vocal about hunting and they'd be like, Hey, you're, I didn't know you were a hunter. I was like, really? Like, why what are you? And, you know, find out they're huge hunters and, you know, they do it, but they just don't talk about it because of the, uh, you know, some of that stigma that's associated with it, at least where we live here. And so, you know, again, if I can be a spokesperson for it to talk about sort of the benefits of it, the the incredible, you know, relationships that I've made, just again being out in the woods and how you know natural and organic that is, and you know, get more people into the woods. That's that's my job now. I got to try to do it, make sure that lifestyle's around for my kids and their kids behind them. Awesome stuff. I uh, really appreciate you spending time with us today, and I love your dad's slogan of um, "Let's make America great again." and I truly feel like if he's elected, he can do that. I believe he's the only one that can do that. And uh, I just uh, want to thank you for, for spending time and uh, uh, wish you the best on your upcoming turkey seasons and um, fishing season this summer. And uh, uh, thank you for spending time here. It's my pleasure, Jay. Thank you very much as well. And good luck to you too. Utah Hydrographics is in the water transfer printing service and they are open to whatever you can dream up. Choose from a wide range of camel patterns, designs, and colors. Whether it's guns, bows, tools, rifle stocks, vehicles, steering wheels, fenders, dashboards, paint guns, fishing rods, cups, tripods, watches, knife grips, helmets for a local sports team or for your motorcycle, picture frames, mailbox, animal skulls, you name it they can probably do it. Utah Hydrographics loves taking things that are general looking and turns them into something that looks fantastic and eye-popping. Give them a call and see what they can do for you and receive up to a 10% discount by using the JScott16 promo code. Visit them at utahhydrographics.com or on Instagram at utahhydrographics. Whether you are interested in elk, deer, Antelope, bighorn sheep, or moose, Western Hunter and Elk Hunter magazines will bring the adventure to your mailbox. These publications feature articles on the finest hunting gear, tips and tactics from experienced hunters, field judging trophies, glassing techniques, calling strategies, and much more. To become a more knowledgeable and skilled hunter, subscribe today. 
Go to westernhunter.net forward slash jscott and enter your email address for a chance to win a $1,500 credit towards any Swarovski product. 